inviting me to join uh, the residency this week and be a critic and spend time with the artists. Uh, shout out to Dennis and Esther, and thank you for all the artists who've uh, welcomed me and you know shared a little bit about their practice. And so today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey as a curator over the last you know, almost 15 years and some of the insights that I've developed and hopefully some of this information that I share will be useful information. Throughout the conversation, there'll be a couple of polls that will be shared. So please, um, you know, fill, fill in the polls because the information will be useful for me throughout the conversation in terms of understanding, you know, certain points where maybe I might spend a little bit more time than I normally do. Um, I usually give this presentation in front of a live audience. So, you know, talking with Liz, we said, okay, well, this is the closest we can get. And obviously the Q&A at the end. And so uh, I'm gonna jump right into it. Uh, and I look forward to your questions and feedback. Um, this should be a fun conversation um, and I'm gonna jump right into it. And so uh, let me just, okay, that's helpful. I'm gonna make this smaller. <laughs> trying not to see myself. Oh, <laughs> um, I know what that's like. This looks... All right, I'll just do this. Okay, so again, my name is Larry Osemensa. This presentation, Lead with the Hustle, again, just shares a little bit of insight into my practice. And I want to just share these 10 things that I, you know, many of you may know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Instagram. I, I think it's a great tool to share information, but also to discover. And so I stumbled upon these 10 things. Um, because a lot of times, you know, whether it's artists, friends, family members, you know, people make excuses as to why they aren't uh, closer to wherever success looks like for them. And so I just want to start by sharing these 10 things that don't require much talent, being on time, um, making an effort, yeah. being high energy, having a positive attitude, being passionate about what you do, um, using good body language, being coachable, um, doing a little extra, being prepared. And I think this in particular with a lot of artists, I think one of the worst things that I can experience in a studio visit is the artist not being prepared for the visit and just kind of winging it. And I think, you know, these are little things that people pay attention to. Um, and having a strong work ethic. I think, you know, for me, I want to start and ground the conversation in this because I think a lot of people have their ideas of what talent is, but for me, it starts with kind of the basics, um, things that we all can kind of do. And so also just want to remind um, the artists, you know, for me, the artist's role in my life has always been about asking questions. It's been about uh, provoking questions, getting people to think more expansively about what's happening in our world, whether it's related to climate change, social justice, um, joy, um, and I want to remind artists the importance of that, but also remember it's important to think outside the box. Um, I think sometimes um, it's very easy to kind of be too close to the work um, and not challenge yourself um, because you get comfortable or you're scared to challenge yourself. And I think for me, it's important that an artist is always cognizant that, you know, part of your creativity and imagination um, and thinking outside the box is what nourishes our communities our societies, but then also it can be a catalyst for explosive growth in your practice. Do you see a lot of artists falling into that trap, Larry? I think sometimes because it's like, it's, it's hard enough to get momentum around the practice. Yeah. You might find a certain body of work that, you know, if you're working with a gallery, they're like, you know, more of the flowers or more of the figures or more of this. And, right. you know, being cog cognizant that like, this is a marathon, right? And it's not mm -hmm. about this one moment or this one exhibition or this one acquisition, but it's the continuous journey um, that feeds you as an artist, as a person, um, as someone who's part of an artistic community. Um, and so I always encourage artists, and I think that's the beauty of the crit, is that you kind of get into a rhythm, you get into a zone. And, you know, sometimes I just might see something that's super simple, but it's that small gesture um, that small shift in artistic expression that really can open it up for artists. Um, and so here, 
this will be the second half of the presentation. Um, so I used to teach a class called The Rules with a good friend of mine, Amani Olu, as a continuing education course at SVA. And you know, this is our toolbox that we utilize to kind of just frame the conversation and it's evolved and changed over time. I've added things, but this is kind of the basic framework from with which I work to share insights from my experience. And so, you know, frameworks and platforms, artistic practice, the art of storytelling through your work, showing up um, is also something that doesn't require talent, um, <laughs> just ability and time. Um, investing in yourself, which we'll talk about and acting professional. Um, so many folks are curious about my journey to where I am now. Um, I started off, you know, my journey in the arts started actually when I was in grad school in 2006. Um, I lived in Europe, would go to the galleries in, you know, London, Rome, Milan, museums. And, you know, I would see, you know, these black and more sculptures or paintings of individuals who clearly looked like they were from the African diaspora. And no one could really explain to me who they were, what their role was in this conversation. And so I just picked this question in my mind to kind of do this personal research to understand this kind of gap in artist art history that people weren't really like always acknowledging. And I also started making photographs of my experience. Um, my family's from Ghana. I'm born and raised uh, in New York City, uh, grew up in the Bronx. And so I didn't grow up going to museums. And so art is something that I came to in my 20s. And I wanted to document these experiences that I was having. And so I came into the art world, you know, as a photographer, worked as a photographer for a while and realized that that wasn't really my calling, I guess. Mm. And uh, so I had to begin the journey of identifying where do I fit within this ecosystem? And so for me, that started with writing, you know, and educating myself about the artists who are of my generation. So I wrote for a number of cultural magazines because at the time, this is like 2009, I didn't necessarily fit the pedigree of you know, being able to write for an art form. So I said, you know, let me start with what I know and let me start with artists who I find interesting. So you have Toyin Nadatola, Toyin Oji Adatola and, and Jadeka Akinelli Crosby, um, who are both artists that I met when they were in their MFA programs. And, you know, I thought they were doing something exciting and wanted to do my best um, to hold space for their practice and shit more light. Can you talk through that process that Oh, I was just going to ask about your your sort of decision to uh, move from being an artist to sort of doing what you just described. And if that was a tough transition or if that was just a natural transition for you. It was a natural transition because the other thing that, you know, I, I always have to remind myself to share. I was also working a full time job, you know, so being an artist was not something that paid the bills for me. It was something that fed a passion. Um, you know, I sold some work but I was not a full-time artist. You know, I wasn't a full-time photographer. I was working in marketing at Viacom until 2015. Um, and I had my, and I was a contracted employee. And my boss at the time, Angelita Sierra, um, called me to her office. Um, and at this time I began curating shows specifically focusing on emerging artists of color because I didn't see enough platforms for them. You know, because at the time, this is again like 08, 09, 2010. If you weren't a person who went to a particular MFA program, you know, didn't fit a particular pedigree, you weren't really getting an opportunity to showcase your work. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that um, was unfair. Mm -hmm. And I'm a person who learns by doing, but also activates by doing. And so I just started putting together shows. Mm -hmm. And I was always transparent about that. And I would take you know, my colleagues um, at Viacom to exhibitions that I was carrying. Um, and my boss, you know, I think one time we had a meeting with some clients in Chelsea and I was running into all these friends that I knew from the art world. And, you know, she one day called me into the office and said, you know what, we're not going to renew your contract. And I freaked out because I thought I did something wrong. And she said, no, you clearly have a passion for this art thing. You need to pursue it. You know, I was, I'm 40, 40 now. Um, I was 35 at the time. So I was making shows, but again, working a full-time job. Yeah. And so when she basically pushed me out of the nest to pursue, you know, what, you know, I believe is what I've been put on the earth to do, 
is to work with artists, help them manifest ideas, um, organizing exhibitions, being in dialogue, um, that fundamentally changed my life. And I basically had to reprogram my mind to work as hard as I would for someone else in a corporate environment and do that for myself. Mm -hmm. And through doing that, you know, um, the universe worked in my favor uh, because when I left Viacom, you know, she gave me too much notice. So it wasn't like a sudden thing. Um, I was able to participate in ICI's curatorial intensive. And so through doing that, um, it just recalibrated how I thought about curatorial practice in general, because, you know, as someone who was soft, self-taught, I thought about it as just being something that was relegated to the white cube. And that mm-hmm. actually was not correct. You know, for me, curatorial practice really is about these conversations. Mm-hmm. You know, so sharing my insights, doing crits. Um, next Tuesday, I'm launching a collaboration with Avent Arte, a series of editions. Um, and feeling comfortable in the fact that I can define what that looks like for myself mm-hmm. and not letting someone else do that. Because early in my career, I think I was trying to keep up with the Joneses, mm-hmm. you know, and, and was living this kind of multi-hyphenate identity. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that really serves me. And I think once I began to figure out, you know, so with this slide, I had to do some self-reflection and think about, you know, what is my role as a leader within this, within this ecosystem? And really focusing on curatorial practice as a foundation and then identifying different threads that kind of um, amplify the curatorial practice. Mm -hmm. And so through that, um, I developed these guiding principles. And as I was mentioning before, um, part of this came from watching a talk that um, Virgil Abloh did at Harvard. And he was talking about these principles that he developed for himself. You know, he's trained as an architect. Um, We know him as a designer. Um, you know, running menswear for LVMH. But for me, it was an interesting prompt to think about, you know, what are my principles? You know, what helps me make decisions as a, a, a curator? And so I invite everyone who's watching this to think about what are your principles? You know, whether you're a curator, whether you're an artist, cultural worker, you know, chef, whatever it is, what are the principles that guide you on a day to day to inform what you do? And so we had the first uh, quick poll question. I would love to know who's in the room. So if you're an artist, curator, cultural worker, please, you know, you know, fill in that button um, because that helps me through this conversation. Um, And then to talk about principles, access, belonging, curiosity, conversation, value, catalyst for diversity, collaboration. These are all things that are super instrumental in shaping how I approach my practice. And so access, you know, for me. I mentioned before, I didn't grow up going to museums. Um, even though I lived down the street from the Bronx Museum, which is now, you know, I feel like part of my family. And so, you know, one thing that I realized over time is that, you know, going to galleries, going to museums can be an intimidating experience if it's something that you're not used to. And so always thinking about when I do an exhibition or a project, how can this be accessible to the largest possible audience? You know, because like in terms of my art world, community, you know, nine times out of 10, they're gonna come regardless. So how do I use this as a platform um, to invite more people to the conversation? Cool, so we have mostly artists in the room, a couple of curators and cultural workers. That's great to see, thank you. Um, And so this image is from a collaboration I did with Nina Chanel Abney and Samora Pendehues at National Sawdust. And I basically, for me, I had been doing exhibitions and I wanted to know what what would a gesture you know, looking at the intersection of music, art, and poetry look like um, in a non, I guess, visual art space. And so, you know, this is something that I did in collaboration with my um, nonprofit that I co-founded, Art Noir. And we wanted it to be something that was in the round, you know, so taking away this hierarchy to a degree, but then allowing the audience to kind of be enmeshed in this experience. Ooh. That's not good. That's not good. Uh, how do we keep? I'm not used to the Mac. I'm a Chromebook user, so. Oh yeah. Give it some hiccups. Oh, there we go. Uh, so you know, again, you know, thinking about creating a sense of belonging, right? Going back to that point about wel- being welcoming, um, inviting, and so the project on the left is a project that I did actually last month uh, mm-hmm. with Bam. I'm, I'm the curator at large at Bam. 
Um, and this is a digital billboard that they have on Lafayette and Flatbush. Um, and it's something that I had actually been eyeing since I started working with BAM. And so we did this as part of a celebration for Martin Luther King. Uh, the project was called Let Freedom Ring. And they invited seven artists to meditate on the notion of freedom. And so we launched it MLK, uh, before MLK on that weekend, uh, all the way to the inauguration, thinking about this new administration and thinking about you know, this, this, this change in leadership and what does leadership, uh, what does freedom mean to these artists? And there was a prompt and that kind of let them respond how they felt. And so this is a self-portrait that Layla incorporated. And the thing that was unique about this project is that I only invited artists who lived and worked in Brooklyn because I was interested in Brooklyn artists talking back to their community. And then the image on the right is from an exhibition I did with Peter Williams at QR Foundation. And I did a collaboration with Urban Word, which is a youth poetry organization. And so they normally do workshops every Wednesday. And so I invited them to come do their workshop at the exhibition. I gave them a tour and then I invited them to kind of respond to what they saw through poetry. And so that was a really great experience. I always try to incorporate some type of educational component for young people. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the projects that I do, I'm always thinking about the 16, 17 year old self and would I be interested in this? Would I be excited about this? Um, mm -hmm. So that's always something that's in the back of my mind. And what was the time span for that project? That sounds really interesting. Did they come in and do that in an afternoon or was it? We a came in an afternoon. And oh. so we probably had like an hour to 90 minute block. Oh, wonderful. Uh, they came after school. Um, and it was great because I think a lot of times we do not give young people credit in terms of their aptitude and intelligence. Yeah. And so, you know, once I gave the tour, I had to shut up and let them do their thing. <laughs> Let them respond. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And so uh, uh, that's always something I try to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. And then curiosity and conversation. You know, I, as someone who self-taught as a curator, I learn by engaging in conversation. I learn by stimulating my curiosity. Um, so the image on the left is from an exhibition I did at Elizabeth D. Um, I think this is 2017, 18. And then on the right, Joan Jonas and Jason Moran, who've been collaborating for over a decade. Oh. Uh, this is a talk that Art Noir um, organized in collaboration with SVA because I was interested in, you know, this intergenerational dialogue. Yeah. You know, this interdisciplinary dialogue and then also intercultural dialogue. Um, and, and what are they learning from each other? Because um, the one thing that I noticed with MFA students is that I wasn't seeing enough collaboration, right, on projects as mm -hmm. a way, you know, you may be a you know, someone who makes video and I make sound or I make paintings or I might do performance. And mm -hmm. how can we learn from each other's skill set to grow within the practice that we're doing? That's so an that interesting was observation because I think a lot of grad students are so encouraged to shine individually and to really yeah. thrive in that way. And the idea of collaboration yeah. could actually open up so many avenues for young artists and emerging artists. Yeah, exactly. And then the reality is that no one is successful by themselves. We all have help, mm -hmm. um, whether it's family, whether it's other artists, a professor, an instructor. And so really kind of honing in on that understanding so that artists don't feel shy to ask for help or collaborate mm -hmm. or just invite artists, other artists into their studio. Because I just personally wasn't seeing enough of that. And so I felt like to, to have two kind of masters at their craft share that was was would be important and then just establishing a sense of value i think is super important um and so again i like to work with a lot of young people uh one it, it, it keeps me energized um and it also keeps me on my toes because you know when you're so enmeshed in this work um you have one kind of read on something and then a young person will just see a whole other thing which for me is how I learn and grow. It shifts my understanding about what I do on a day to day. Mm -hmm. um, catalyst for diversity. So again, when I think about diversity, I'm not only thinking about race, I'm also thinking about class, you know, social economic uh, uh, issues, um, how people might identify LGBTQI issues. Um, and so always trying to keep that in my mind, you know, because I think after the last year, 
you're seeing a lot of institutions kind of recalibrate, you know, their inclusion of BIPOC artists or creatives. Mm -hmm. And for me, I made that decision four years ago that like, that's just gonna be part of the work. Um, I'm not necessarily always gonna call it out as being diverse, it's just gonna be, you mm -hmm. know, so even I have a show that's up at the New York Academy of Art now and making sure that, at least in my mind, it's not something that I'm gonna like put in a press release that there's a certain amount of black artists, Latinx artists, Southeast Asian, you know, if they're um, artists who may have disabilities, making sure that the spectrum of creative expression and ideas and identities are represented is something that I constantly do in every project that I, I, I put together. Yeah, and that's especially evident when you showed that age range in that collaborative um, artist duo that you yeah. were talking about. That yeah. was really interesting and unusual. You don't see that often, actually. No, I mean, I think that's something I realized working with Peter, um, because Peter's 68 now, wheelchair mm -hmm. bound. I met Peter when I did the ICI intensive, mm -hmm. and he made more work at the time. He was maybe like 65, 66 than a lot of the younger artists. I was like, oh, I got to work with this guy. Um, and I think also so much of my practice foundationally has been, it comes from this point of romance in terms of like identifying the artists of my generation and then growing with them, mm -hmm. you know, but then over time realizing that they're masters at their mm -hmm. work who maybe had their moment and have fallen out of vogue or maybe never had their moment. Mm -hmm. And so how do I use my platform now to identify those artists, collaborate with them, learn from them, but then also help them, you know, understand how social media can be an incredible tool to share ideas, for example. Um, and so it's for me at this stage of my career, trying to find as many different things that will help me just grow um, and not be satisfied with what I've been able to achieve, which has been a blessing but knowing that there's still more that I can do in my practice, whether it's formally through the exhibition making or informally just through, you know, mentoring or working with artists. Um, this is from an exhibition I did, Coffee Room Sugar Gold. I co-curated this with um, Dexter Wimberly, who is another um, independent curator. We've been collaborating together for almost the past decade and always doing different projects together. Um, and this is a project I did at Ulite um, fall 2019. Um, and it was an exhibition when I was still senior curator at MOCAD. And so I was interested in a conversation between artists that I had been meeting and in dialogue with in Detroit with an artist that I had been meeting and dialogue with in Miami, mm. um, both on night foundation cities um, and both are cities that I, I saw kind of a, a correlation in the relationship. And so mm. I wanted to organize something that allowed for a deeper exploration of that. And then collaboration for me is super important. I can't achieve any of this without, you know, with, for Art Noir, I have six other incredible co-founders. Um, I have an incredible mentee in Chiara Ventura who uh, works with me on a lot of um, curatorial projects. Um, when I can bring her in, she's a co-curator. She's 24, 25. And for me, you know, I didn't have someone do that for me. And so that's something I'm always mindful of. Um, cause I'm also learning from her in terms of like, you know, what are the conversations that, you know, uh, individuals of her generation are having and how can I, you know, organize something that can activate that in a meaningful way. And then also thinking about cross-disciplinary, you know, so with Joan and, and, uh, Jason, you have visual arts performance and music. This is, um, yeah, Jesse, who's a, you know, New York times bestselling author. So thinking about the intersection of art and literature. Mm. Um, and then on the right is from an exhibition I co-curated with Catherine uh, Fuller called Race and Revolution, Still Separate, Still Unequal. And that looked at school segregation. And so we had this one piece by J.C. Lenahan. Um, the exhibition traveled to about four or five venues. Um, and it asked two basic questions. You know, what was, your, what was your race moment? What was your class moment? And inviting the audience to be part of the exhibition and to activate um, mm -hmm. is something that I'm always thinking about when opportunities make sense to include that, you know, because I, I don't want the projects that I put together to just be these passive experiences. You know, how can you make them active? Mm -hmm. Whether it's inclusion of these type of projects or through public programs. 
And so did those participants have to kind of step across those books physically yeah. to do that? I mean, that yeah. seems like another way to kind of physically include people or challenge people to participate. And it's almost a barrier and an invitation at the same time. Exactly. And it was interesting just because of the books in general, because I didn't really kind of think about how sacred books are for a lot of people, you know, and they would look at the text and they said, we can't step on these. These are like, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but me thinking about the psychological barriers that we have, whether it's going into a gallery, going into a museum, if you're a collector trying to buy art, asking questions and, 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 and feeling silly, mm -hmm. it all for me comes back to this point about access. Um, and letting people know that it is okay to be part of the experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's a learning and growing in that, not only through the actual action, but then seeing what other people share through their experiences. Um, and this is another piece that I did with Glenn Kino, who is an artist that I've known for a long time and we had never formally collaborated. And um, we, when uh, Bam invited me, to be curator for the Rudin Family Gallery, he was one of the first people that I thought about. And so this is just kind of the process of working together, learning from each other, responding to each other. Um, and it turned out to be an incredible exhibition. And so now we're gonna get into the meat and potatoes because I wanna be mindful of time. Um, but this is from John Berger's Way, Ways of Seeing. It's a book and it's also a documentary that was done for the BBC. It's on YouTube, you can search it, it's free. But talking about the importance of perspective um, and what do you choose to center, I think is something that artists should always, not only artists, we also think about, you know, what is centering, what is important for us. Um, and I, I wanna ground this part of the presentation in that. And so going back to the toolbox, so frameworks and platforms. So for me, you know, I gave you my principles that guide me in terms of what I do. And then, you know, I like to think about myself as a conceptual archeologist. And so these are the things that I, I activate the curatorial practice. So obviously exhibitions, you know, but public programs, social media publications. And so exhibitions is, you know, the bread and butter of my curatorial practice, making shows, um, creating space for dialogue. Um, so this is Peter Williams, I actually curated this is a show I co-curated with Rebecca um, Mazi at MoCAD. It was Peter's first solo show in Detroit. He spent 17 years in Detroit um, teaching at Wayne State. So this was a homecoming. And this is the second solo exhibition that I had the opportunity of working with him on. And so one thing that I'd like to point out is that some curators have artists that, you know, you have one dialogue and conversation with, and then some you have multiple dialogues and conversations with, you know, throughout the lifespan of, you know, your career together. And so that's something to think about, you know, if you have curators who are part of your life, you know, how, how do you make sure that that's a constant, whether that's just letting them know what you're working on, inviting them to studio visits. I think with COVID, I've done a lot of virtual visits, virtual presentations. So how do you leverage the tools that are available to you to uh, engage in these conversations, share what you're working on, um, and, and, you know, not use being at home, as an excuse, right? Mm -hmm. Public program. So I did a conversation with um, Hugo McLeod, um, who's an artist and friend that we've been collaborating together the last 10 years. Um, and this is um, from a conversation we did in, uh, around our Basel when it was online. Um, I'm wearing the wig just to add a little bit of fun. Um, <laughs> I love it. That's so great. You know, because again, like I think to make a living doing this, I, I recognize the blessing in it. And, you know, we watch a lot of talks and Zooms online and like, how do you make this fun, interesting, lively. Um, and so utilizing social media as a tool for public programming, sharing information. Another platform that I've come to really depend on is Clubhouse, um, which is another social media tool. So like on Monday evening, I'm doing a conversation with Eddie uh, Martinez and Angel um, Otero around two new exhibitions that they have up. Oh, cool. That sounds great. And then publication. So making catalogs. I also collaborate with a lot of artists on prints. I mean, I've been doing that for the last five years um, with Art and Culture Project. So this is a print we released in December with Von Spad. And I'm going to be le releasing um, a series of new prints through a new partnership with Avent Arte 
Um, that'll be announced next Tuesday. But it's another way for me to engage an artist. Mm -hmm. We kind of co-create, you know, this, this object that goes into the world. And also, you know, educating people on prints as like another way to collect. Mm -hmm. um, but then also artists, another way to kind of extend the practice. Because mm -hmm. I think people think of prints as just a reproduction. And I know here at the ranch, you guys are, you know, have one of the top, you know, printmaking facilities in the world. I mean, I know so many artists who come here to learn about printmaking or make prints. And so for me, this is an important component to the practice. Wonderful. And so getting into, you know, another layer of the toolbox. So, you know, artistic practice, what is your why? You know, why are you an artist? You know, are you setting reasonable goals for yourself? Are you keeping your fingers on the pulse of what's happening? You know, how are you, what, what's influencing the practice? And how do you find inspiration? So we have another poll here. You know, what are your goals as an artist for those who are here? Do you want to just be famous? Do you just want to make money? Do you want to have global recognition, be in museum collections? Or do you want, excuse me, engage in a practice and be part of a community? And I would love, you know, to hear your thoughts on that. And so what is your why? You know, what's the purpose of you being an artist? And it's not enough to just say, oh, because it's what I'm good at. You know, I always like to ask people, ask yourself why five times? Because, you know, answering why am I an artist five times, by the third, it gets really tough. But mm -hmm. I think if you understand what is undergirding the practice, it helps you in your decision making, what you choose to do, what you choose not to do, mm -hmm. what you choose to pursue, and also pushes you through those hard times. You know, because the journey of an artist is a marathon and it's going to go up and down. And when it goes down, it's important to know why are you doing this? You know, why are you in this? You know, how are you fulfilling your purpose? And what steps are you taking to make your goals that you set for yourself actionable? What is your how? You know, so I talked about guiding principles for my practice. Do you have guiding principles for your practice as an artist, curator, cultural worker? Um, engage, oh, that's what I like. That, that's what I like to see. <laughs> engage in a practice and community. No, it's beautiful to see because a lot of times, you know, and no judgment on why you do it. People have other motives. Um, but to know that it's about being engaged in this generative dialogue and conversation, for me, is heartwarming. Um, but, you know, what is your how? Are you developing a work schedule? You know, the reality is that, you know, there's a finite amount of artists who are able to fully survive off their artistic practice. Some people might have to have a job. You know, so I always think about, you know, so what is your schedule? You know, so here we have another quick question. You know, what are your challenges? You know, do you not have enough time? No network or community, no gallery, not getting feedback. You know, are you developing a work schedule? You know, how are you utilizing your five to nine, as I like to say, mm -hmm. you know, in addition to your nine to five or being a parent or whatever other responsibilities that you have? How are you challenging yourself in the studio? And so, you know, the, the another tier to this toolbox is thinking about the art of storytelling. You know, so we have a couple of artists. I'm gonna run through, I'm sure you're familiar with some of these names. Mm. And they've built a specific vocabulary. And Liz, if you know any of them, shout the name out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and there's Faith Ringgold, all right. Yeah. So great. And Yayoi Kasama. This one's hard to see behind the pole thing, but I. <laughs> I think this is Sai. Oh, it is. Yeah, I think okay. it is. But throwing a little, you know, kind of abstract gesture in there. And so for me, I like to think about artists as entrepreneurs, sole proprietors, um, not enough time, no community, feedback. Okay, great. So we'll get into that. Um, I would also like, and I know this is a yucky word. <laughs> but um, I think of artists as brands. You know, you're developing a vocabulary, mm -hmm. you're developing a way of working, you're developing a sensibility that people become familiar with, they begin to depend on, you know? So mm -hmm. I like to think about, you know, artistic practice at, in some respects, not all the time, as solving a problem, you know? And so, what does your practice offer us to solve this problem or ask questions or 
um, invite us to think more deeply about particular issues? Um, what is your position on these things? And what's mm -hmm. the promise? You were saying something, Liz? Oh, no, I think that's a really interesting thing about branding. And yeah. I wonder too about the idea of kind of establishing yourself with a brand, but then not putting yourself in a box and the, the sort of thing you were saying about continuing to challenge yourself, but also exactly. establishing yourself. And I, and I think that's the important juxtaposition, right? So you build a brand, you build a vocabulary, a way of working, mm -hmm. a quality of work, an experience, but you have to continue to challenge yourself. Because what I found with artists, friends of mine who are mid-career, you know, so they've, they've, you know, they've struggled, they've pushed, they've blood, sweat, and tears, and now they have some momentum, you know. Mm -hmm. Financially, they're in a good place, mm -hmm. right? And what ends up happening is that they get into this purgatory yeah. where, like, they can make a hundred of these log cabins, <laughs> but it's not really nourishing them. Yeah. And if you don't challenge yourself, you, you know, I think about Damon Hurst, you know, who's somebody mm -hmm. that some would deem polarizing, but I was watching something on Instagram and he was showing us these spin paintings that he was doing in the 90s, I believe. <laughs> yeah. And he had one that was like on rotation. And me reflecting back to, you know, this pretty interesting and innovative. Yeah. Regardless of how you feel. But even he came to a point where his studio just became too large. Right. The work lost its soul. Uh -huh. For me, it's not always about technical proficiency. It's also like, is there a soul in the practice? Right. Is there energy and vibration in the practice? Yeah. And so always kind of keeping that at the forefront, regardless of how successful or known you become, mm -hmm. always baking into the practice these, these components that allow you to challenge yourself. Mm hmm and so thinking about what are you investigating through the practice? You know, what's the practice about? You know, a lot of times I talk to artists and, you know, I say, hey, so what's the work about? And, you, and, and some people struggle and that could be for a myriad of reasons. Sometimes people are shy or some people haven't thought about it deeply. And mm -hmm. so I invite people to think about like answering this question. Um, like I did an IG live through Art Noir with Fahamu Peku. And he had mentioned, you know, before he starts a series, um, of new paintings, he writes a five to 10 page essay on what the work is about. Now, obviously you don't need to go that deep, but mm -hmm. like these things are important, you know, as part of the practice. Absolutely. And I think so many people are so concerned with being individual or being the next big thing rather than thinking about the other artists they're in conversation with or what, exactly. what's truly inspiring them because they feel like they don't want to necessarily admit that. And I think that is part of an, it's a little bit of art school. I'm not trying to be down on art school, but yeah. there's a little bit of that where it's saying, yeah. is this derivative? You get that question a little too often. And I think yeah. what you're saying is you're part of a community and a conversation, figure out what that spot is, figure out where you stand kind of. Yeah, but I think also like, you talking about influence, knowing who did it before you and don't be under the assumption that you invented something, right. you know, and it's okay to respond to something that has existed in the world, mm -hmm. but it also comes down to your interpretation of it. Right. Um, thinking about your position. So what kind of artist, curator, creative are you? You know, what do you seek to express through the practice? You know, what can we expect to learn and experience when we see your work, you know? And so for me, another toolkit, you know, so in the beginning, we talked about 10 things mm -hmm. that don't require talent. This should that. be number 11, mm -hmm. you know, showing up. Oh, I think I'm going to mess this slide up. Mm -hmm. Did I? No, I got it. Um, and so, you know, I think I was talking with Freddie earlier about networking, mm -hmm. right? And for me, I've over time learned to make this distinction between networking and building relationships, mm -hmm. right? Um, cause I used to hate going to something and like, you had that one person work in the room and just kind of like give you the business card and not really taking any interest in who you are, or they take too much interest in who you are and really don't engage in a dialogue. And I think it's important for people to understand that particularly within the arts community, this is a human based thing. It's about people, mm -hmm. you know, it's about relationships, whether they're, close relationships or loose relationships, but it's about dealing with people on a, on a, on a human level. And, you know, so networking is like grab a drink, 
But you know, when you think about having dinner with somebody, breaking bread, that's a very intimate thing. Absolutely. You know, and so making the distinction and kind of understanding that when you're engaging in particular uh, activities is important. That's an important yeah. distinction to make. It's a nice way to articulate that. Yeah. And then that thing, networking, you know, I used to be the guy going to five events in one night. And now I kind of just focus on events that, you know, I'm either truly interested in or it allows me an opportunity to celebrate the work of an artist or creative that I respect, admire, or, or friendly with. You know, so these are strategies that I think, you know, will help you expand your network you know, and build relationships. You know, so showing up as much as possible within reason, obviously with COVID, that's a little bit more challenging, but I think there's a myriad of virtual um, experiences that I think people can uh, explore. But I think, you know, also when I say that, I say that with a caveat that like, don't feel the obligation to go to everything. It is important to manage self-care and mm -hmm. rest. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if there is a big show coming to town and there's a, you have an opportunity to go to the opening, meet the artists, you know, particular people will be in the room, you know, really think about, you know, being there. Because a lot of times opportunity drops on your lap because you just were ready and you happen to be there. Cultivate your existing network. I think, and this is not just for artists, this is just for people. I mean, think about, I know at the beginning of COVID, you know, sitting in my house for three months, all the people that I hadn't talked to in years that I all of a sudden had the urge to call. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just check in. Right. Because it's I think how that works with COVID. Yeah. You know? but, but you realize the fragility of life, mm -hmm. right? And I think by cultivating your existing network, it keeps you top of mind. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, if you're working on a project and if I do a visit with an artist and they're like, oh, I'm making this ceramic piece. And I have a friend, um, Aaliyah Williams, who works at Deitch, who's doing a ceramic show in September. I can be like, oh, you need to talk to Aaliyah. And now that might manifest into an exhibition opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, start to join a critique group. Um, I know that not having a community was something that was mentioned. So thinking about, you know, the artists that you do know, can you start a critique group, whether you're able to physically go to each other's studio or meet once a week and do virtual studio visits. But if you don't have it, try to think about how can you create it? Um, because again, success is not something that happens in a vacuum. Um, trade artwork, I feel like Artists don't do this enough, you know, either buy artwork or trade. Um, but I think living with art that inspire, inspires you, I think is something that's um, important. But I think also as an artist, you know, the uh, validation that comes with someone wanting to have your work, your creation, your imagination in their home and living with it. And so thinking about that as an opportunity Participate in residency. So all the artists here um, for Home and Away via Ulight, mm -hmm. you guys are getting it done. I think residencies are a great way to engage in dialogue with other artists, learn new skills, um, particularly for someone that maybe did not get an MFA. I personally think residencies are another way to kind of um, learn and grow within the practice. Seek mentorship. And mentorship, um, it's important to make this distinction for me is not just because someone's older than you. They might just know something that you don't know and they could be your age or younger. Right. You know, so like if you want to learn about the latest social media tool, you might want to talk to a millennial. Um, and so I think, again, growth and success and achievement does not happen in the vacuum. Teach a class if you can. I think that's a great way to kind of calibrate if you know your stuff. Mm -hmm. And that could be volunteer, that could be with young people, that could be in a, in a classroom setting. Mm -hmm. Collaboration, I mentioned earlier, invite people to your studio as much as possible. People you trust, you know, because I know the studio is a sacred space. So you want to invite the right energy into that space. And write, you know, so I mentioned writing about the practice is important. And so this is a new component, invest in yourself. So people say they don't have enough time. I think you got to steal the time, <laughs> right? We got all kinds of distractions. First thing you do is you wake up, you look at your phone, you look at text messages, you look at your Instagram, you look at your Facebook. Instead of doing that, why don't you commit 10, 15 minutes to reading a book? Whether it's something about your practice, 
or something of interest to you or is meditative. Um, but I think really looking at your day, you know, looking at your schedule mm -hmm. and carving that time out. If you're a parent, you know, can you work in collaboration with, you know, your partner or family or babysitter? You know, because I think if you can get even one hour a day, yep. you'll be surprised how much more productive you would be. It's amazingly true. And I mean, I have two very young children, toddlers, and it's might only be one hour a day, but we can, you can carve it out if, you know, if you try. So, yeah. And so I think really making the effort to look at the 24 hours in a day, you can carve out one hour. If it's someone who has to commute in the car, what yeah. are you listening to? You know, could you be listening to podcasts, artist talks, um, artist books? You know, really trying to think about where are there inefficiencies in your day that you can possibly use as a way to reclaim your time? Residencies we talked about, but I think also formal, like the ones that the artists from Ulai are doing with Anderson Ranch, but also self-organized. So I did a self-organized residency in uh, October, November, where I went to Hugo McLeod's um, home in uh, Mexico. Yeah. So he lives in Tulum, and I spent you know two, three weeks there writing reading, did some critiques with him. So you could also just take a weekend and just say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna use this weekend to write or mm -hmm. read. Um, so great, so we have this poll. Most people are productive in the morning and then we have evening. So thinking about how you're utilizing that morning more effectively if you can. How are you utilizing that evening, You know, that five to nine more effectively if you can. Um, and I want to be mindful of time uh, so, so we can address questions. Studying your craft, this should be self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Learn about the business of art. This is a business. I don't know, I know we don't like to talk about that, but I think if you're making objects that are for sale, yeah. then you are participating in a business. And I think trying to learn as much about it as possible, I think give yourself the tools, mm -hmm. I think is important. If you don't understand something, ask. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and leverage, you know, the current opportunities you have into the next opportunity. That's just something that I've always done. And it's just been help, helpful in creating momentum for myself. Court vision. So those of you who watch basketball, it's looking at the whole playing field, trying to look at the bigger picture. You know, what are your personal goals and how do you get to those goals? Um, and setting reasonable goals and objectives and creating a safe plan, which I'll talk about really briefly. And if anybody's interested in this, it's um, something that, you know, me and Amani developed as a actualization tool, right? So I'll run through this quickly. You know, so if, uh, you know, your goal is to get into grad school or work with a gallery, you know, what are these steps? You know, so we say that what the action is and what resources that you may have available um, to achieve this target, right? Um, so do you know somebody, if you're talking about grad school, who went to the school, who's an alumni, who's an instructor? Um, thinking about how are you measuring success with these particular targets? What are the challenges you may, may have and how do you work through those challenges? And then what are the results? I think a lot of times we don't measure the results of goals that we set for us. Yeah. And so making sure that you're calibrating, you know, so if it's getting five exhibitions and you only get four, for example, in a year, why didn't you get that fifth? You know, or maybe these four were just like super quality that you want to focus your energy on. Um, five mistakes that people make. Don't be a networking jerk. Nobody likes a jerk. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a human, you know, treat people like humans, treat them with respect. Mm -hmm. um, we don't reach out to people only when you need something. You know, and this goes back to my point about cultivating your networking relationships. Try your best. I mean, obviously we can't be in touch with everybody, but a text message, uh, a comment, you know, I have some friends that, you know, once a month, like even with my cousins, we do a Zoom once a month. It's like 15 of us. But like, you know, staying on, in, in touch, I think is super important. Mm -hmm. Not properly following through on commitments is like one of my worst pet peeves with artists. If we have a conversation and agree, agree to do something, Please follow through on that. If you can't do it, say you can't do it. You know, I'd rather hear a no than a yes and you don't deliver. Because the thing is that artists don't realize that curators talk, collectors talk, you know, 
gather is talk. And if your name comes up and I'm just like, ah, that person's not reliable, you don't realize how many opportunities that you're missing out on because you just don't uh, uh, follow through on your word. Mm -hmm. So, you know, be mindful of that. If you can't do it, be transparent about it. If you can, stick to your word. Don't be opportunistic. And don't take things personal. You know, there are a lot of things that occur that, you know, artists might think it's about them. Um, and a lot of times it might just be about circumstance. It might be about what that individual is going through. Um, but don't take that to heart. I mean, obviously if it's something that's overtly disrespectful, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But if it's, you know, not getting into a residency or a grad program or an exhibition, you know, in those situations, I would ask for feedback. You know, what was it about my application that I can improve? And I think a lot of artists don't do that enough when they apply for residencies, for example. So if you apply for something and don't get it, ask for feedback, see how you can improve your, 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 your application so that if you do choose to reapply, um, that you have a heightened chance of being uh, selected. Mm -hmm. So again, these are the rules of engagement, the toolbox, Again, thinking about what the framework and platforms that you utilize for your practice, what is your why in terms of artistic practice, the importance of telling your story, and it doesn't necessarily always need to be personal, but what are you teaching us, sharing with us, helping us understand, helping us uh, uh, investigate, explore through the practice, um, showing up, whatever that looks like for you, investing in yourself is probably the number one thing that you can do, particularly in this time, mm -hmm. learning a new skill. I know for me, I learned how to bake bread, invest in the stock market, um, and a, a whole myriad of other things. Yeah. So really <laughs> investing in yourself and be professional, you know, because um, that's super important. Me as a curator, I want to work with people who are professionals. Um, we can have a conversation. If there's a problem, we address it professionally. Um, um, because that is what's going to feed long-term, long-lasting uh, collaborative relationships. That's, that's it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Larry. That was amazing. Thank you for sharing all of that. I think it's so hard sometimes for artists when we're working in our studios, particularly when it's snowing out and you're kind of in this isolation, you know, to think about those bigger picture kind of um problems and challenges. So that was super helpful. I want to um, take some questions from the residents and from the audience. If people can type in questions in the Q&A box down in the lower right hand corner, you're welcome to do that as we talk. I do have some already that have been um, submitted. So we'll just take them right now. Um, Freddie, who you spoke to earlier. Yeah wanted to, he asked this question earlier on, and I think you kind of answered it, but I think I'm gonna pose it anyway. He asked about what's the essence of what a curator's job is? Like, so, what, what do you see as that? So Freddie, for you, knowing you work in film, a curator would be like a producer, right? So it's our job, uh, like in some cases, a producer might help ideate an idea. Um, a producer might help raise funds. A producer helps get the film done. And so in the case of the curator, for me, it's discovering artists, discovering talent, um, providing a context in with which their creative expression could be seen and engaged with, um, creating platforms for dialogue and conversation. Um, and, you know, the root of it is, you know, to, uh, to care, to care. So creating a sense of care um, for these artistic ideas um, and really being a steward and champion for artists. And, you know, and then I mentioned, you know, in my visit with Freddie that I had the opportunity to produce two short films and, uh, you know, understanding you gotta raise the money, mm -hmm. work on casting, um, actors and, you know, the team, production team, um, making sure the film gets edited, marketed, um, mm -hmm. applying for film festivals, you know? And so taking a lot of that weight sometimes off the director. Um, and so for me, that's my role is how do I work with an artist, help them actualize ideas that they may have, um, take some weight off of them so they can focus on creating um, and be a partner, you know, and be a collaborator. Um, and so that looks, yeah, that has a lot of different faces. That could be with Peter's case, 
curating a solo bit, exhibition of his work or doing a group show with an artist. Um, and so for me, it's, it's, it's being a partner, being a steward, being an evangelist for artists and creating context for where their work can be uh, explored and understood. Cool. Okay, well, we have another question, uh, one from Shire. Um, what would you like to see more of in the visual art world and less of? I think more collaboration, um, more transparency, because I think we there are a lot of people who thrive off the lack of transparency, mm -hmm. um, more funding. <laughs> I mean, we're, I think we're one of the few, you know, developed nations that doesn't have a ministry of culture. <laughs> so a lot of art related activities or funding comes through the State Department or the um, NEA. Um, and so how can more federal funds coupled with private money support the arts, whether it's education, whether it's, you know, grants, nonprofit organizations. Like I think about all the Canadian artists that I've collaborated with who they're able to apply for a grant and, you know, make a project come to fruition. And so I think more funding towards the arts. Um, I mean, those are kind of the key things that kind of come to mind. Okay, well, um, I think we have time for one more question and there's um, a really good one on here. Um, from an anonymous, somebody who posted anonymously, it says, as a shy artist working in solitude, what are some steps towards collaboration for the first time? That's a very good question. Um, I think, take a look at your circle of influence. Anybody who's read Stephen Covey's, uh, what is it? Seven Steps for Highly Effective People. He talks about your circle of influence. So like, who are the immediate people that know you, know your work? You know, so that could be a family member, that could be a friend, that could be a classmate. But thinking about who's around you that you know and trust, who one can give you feedback, but then two help you explore potential ways to expand the practice and collaborate, right? Because it's understanding like what does collaboration look like? You know, is that working with another artist? Is that working with a curator? Is that working with a printmaker? Um, depending on the kind of work you make, like, you know, I think about if you, let's say make fiber-based work and you were collaborating with, you know, a seamstress, for example, or a quilt maker. Um, so I think it comes down to kind of what kind of work you make, you know, identifying where there are opportunities for expansion also thinking about where you might feel like you're creatively deficient. So like, you know, let's say for me, I might want to make a movie, you know? Yeah. I've produced some films, but I've never written a script, you know? So I might say, hey, Freddie, I got this idea, but I have no clue how to like start writing the script. You know, can I pitch this idea to you high level and see if it's interesting uh, that we write together, for example. Um, so I think it's a lot of exploring and asking questions and then just beginning to kind of engage with people you trust. And sometimes those people you trust can be your publicists and evangelists and help you identify those, those ways that you can kind of collaborate and expand and begin to uh, grow within the practice. Oh, that's a great answer. Thank you. I, I'm sure whoever it is um, really appreciated that answer. Um, we're kind of out of time, so we're going to have to wrap it up. But I really wanted to thank you, Larry. That was really oh. great. Thank no, you. So thank much. you, Liz. It was a great thank conversation. You. Yeah. Thank you to everybody at Anderson Ranch. Thank you to Ulai, the Ulai family, all the artists. Um, it's been a great couple of days here. Thank you for everybody who watched uh, the conversation. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, you can hit me on Instagram. It's my name, Ariel Semenza, so not hard to find. Um, and I look forward to continuing the dialogue with you guys. Great. And I just want to also say that um, the artists, the re artists in residence are going to be doing a virtual open studios on March 4th from 4 to 5 p.m. So anybody who's on here um, who would like to log on for that, it's going to be really fun. We did a meet the residents a couple of weeks ago, and now we're going to see the work they've produced while at Anderson Ranch and their thoughts about the experience. So we look forward to that. 
Larry, again, thank you so much. And thank, thank you. you everybody else for joining us and good night. Bye-bye.